Hello everyone, Homes at Home. Actually, we are at live at Improve Canada and this uh, superstore, you could call it, that I happen to love. And we'll be talking more about that later. Right now I have my daughter, Sherry, with Hi. us. <laughs> we're gonna be talking about uh, behind the scenes, some exciting things, uh, little things that we're doing, secrets on the show uh, that you have been asking me about nonstop. Also, we'll be talking to a pod pond casting not a podcasting <laughs> so pond which we'll get into my pond and my property he's an expert uh one of the designers here at improve canada will be on with me later and we're going to be talking about covid changes when it comes to designing so sherry hi uh, hi you gotta say hi i like the mask because it went really well with your white top and, you and, the and i mask. have my i have black and white shoes on so i feel like i'm really organized today. i feel like i'm i'm with it i got it today so one of the big questions everyone is asking us is behind the scenes. Mm. To we take a take, whatever is it? To, how how many, long does it take to take one take? How, how long does it take to take one take? So how long does it take? Now you first, I don't know if anyone knows this, and I've said it a hundred times, but you know maybe not everyone has seen it. Sherry first started when we did New Orleans and we went down and rebuilt the Lower Ninth and came up with a hurricane proof home category five. It was a lot of fun. I was 21. She was 21. She didn't want to be a contractor, <laughs> but she loves to travel. So I, I being dad, I said, hey, did you want to travel to Atlanta? You know, we're going to go down to yeah. New Orleans. You want to travel with us and we're going to help the people down there. And she goes, I'm in. How can you really say no to helping people? And I used to be a backpacker. I traveled the world. So I was like, okay, I've never been to New Orleans. Let's do it. Um, so yeah, I, I actually started without any interest in construction, but mostly because it's kind of something we did as a bonding thing when we were younger, like our, my parents were split up. So, um, we used to just hang out and do work at his house and that was kind of like our weekend thing. So to me, it wasn't a career necessarily. Hi, how are you? I love your work too. Also, my name is spelled with a Y. That could be I, it could be Y, it doesn't matter. It's the same, I don't care. I same crap, everything. different point. I answered everything. So behind the scenes, uh, what's one of the funny things? Because I don't know if you guys know this, but we could probably film a television show just behind the scenes. Uh, it, the funniness, the things that happen, and I, I, I swear that you would absolutely love to watch that show. I think everyone always asks us about bloopers too, and I think our bloopers are really funny, but um, we got asked, how long does it take to take one take? Um, and that's kind of an interesting question because it is merchant construction with a television series, which is already different anyway, and it can be quite difficult. Um, so something like this, where we're doing an interview and we're talking is more of like a take. So if I'm speaking and I say something wrong, I don't know, I flub a word somehow. Um, that's another take. Otherwise, hi, we love you. Um, otherwise, you know, it's not really a take. It's all kind of caught on the fly. It is what it is. This is our job. So in other words, uh, it really doesn't take a lot. We don't take a lot of takes. Actually, we just, the camera follows, it plays, it's real. There is no script. So the only screw up may be if, like Sherry said, if she flubbers. And then I'll just ask her the question again and boom, we go right back into it. I love Chicago. I wish I was there too. Uh, I'm going to be flying into Chicago soon to get to Atlanta, which you're going to be hearing about really soon. I'll, tell, I'll give you the excitement. I believe it's going to be next week. That's another story. Uh, but what's one of your favorite? Uh, Do you guys eat lunch? Is there a catered spread or does everyone come with a lunchbox and a thermos from Christina? At work. Yeah. Um, well, I usually always come kind of with a lunchbox and a thermos uh, during film days. We do sometimes have a catering because we don't have the time to leave site. No one, no one can go out and order lunch. We are, we only have so much time to eat and go. And sometimes you're eating while you're working. Um, I am a bit of a picky eater. I'm not picky. I love food, but I like healthy food. Um, so, oh yeah, I love Newfoundland. My mom's from St. John's. Um, actually, Bell Island. But um, sorry, I got distracted. <laughs> I we, eat healthy. <laughs> we usually have lunch catered. So uh, either someone from the company goes out and picks up the lunch or we actually have someone bring in the Bye. lunch. And uh, it's it, that way I keep everyone on set because you know what it's like when oh, everyone yeah. from the construction crew. Oh, I would Callie. love to bring Callie to California. Everyone from the construction crew, if they go out and eat, they tend to take too long. Then they need a couch to get back to work. It doesn't so keep people at work, we get right back to it again. It's, I like to be efficient. Now, what is one of your favorite, let's call it moments behind the scene that you can remember? Uh, oh my God. Something funny. There's so many. Um, when we filmed 
I'll just talk about uh, Next Generation, which is actually one of my favorite shows to film. I love that show. Um, and it was actually when you dropped a cabinet on your finger and broke your finger. So he breaks his finger and he's like, oh, I'm fine. His finger's like this big. Um, and I was like, no, you need to go to a doctor. Like, get out of here. You can't really be doing demo with us with a broken hand. Like, what are you thinking? And so he took a toilet paper roll and I helped him tape it to his finger and he thought he was fine. Turns out he wasn't fine. I was fine. It was totally fine. So we went black, blue, and then purple. It was kind of uh gross. No, I'll tell you how that worked. I was holding up the cameras right on my left. I'm holding up the upper cabinet. I'm pulling out the last screw. And I turn, I think, to talk to Sherry, and the cabinet just came down and slammed me right on the countertop and caught my baby finger. So it was quite the little, we'll call it boo-boo, but the toilet paper roll worked. Now, years ago, I don't know if you know this. Because, How does it feel to be a grandfather again? you got to answer that one. Uh, well, let me tell you, between Wyatt, Emily, and now Callie, uh, I couldn't be happier. I was afraid at first because it just says that I'm beginning, I'm getting old, but I have to remember I started young. Callie is so beautiful. Oh, my God, she is. And, and I want everyone to know it is Sherry. Oh Callie God. is Sherry as a baby because <laughs> Callie can have that mean look, that oh attitude. God. No, I don't want that. Yeah. But she can smile like you can't imagine. That's really Sherry. Callie's got some sass. Okay, favorite tool. Um, I don't know if it's a hand tool, but my favorite like hand tool to always have in my in my belt is my hammer. I love my hammer so much. I use it for everything. Things I probably shouldn't use a hammer for, but I feel like I'm gonna rely on it. For. Well, you smash a lot of things. Yes, I do. And then I'd probably say a reciprocating saw. Um, I think you can use really it. Yeah. over a drill. I I feel like you can use it for anything. If I feel like cutting something, oh, it's awesome. Like I said, she likes to smash what things, wreck things. What are your favorite tools? Uh, um, for me, it's the impact drill. Uh, it's got to be strapped to my side. The hammer's one, the drill's the other, and it's pretty much that simple. My eye's good for a level, so I don't really need to carry a level, but you know me. I'm a freak oh. for that, and I will use a level. How many levels do I have? Oh, my God. Who counts? He's got like a garage full of level. <laughs> How far in advance do you contact with people whose houses you work on? I see you doing this for another 20 years because you love it, Terry. Oh, boy, another 20 years. Terry, another 20 years. <laughs> um, I might need a vacation. He doesn't know how to stop. Uh, uh, we tried to make, I mean, we need to be set up. This is, this is a hard world of production versus construction. When it comes to construction, it's easy to set everything up, including you know all the trades and, and get it going, but no different than we need to get the permits and everything for the job site. Production is going to be the same. We're going to need to find the story, get it approved through the network, someone that we really want to help. I never do go to the house first. I have people that do that. They take pictures. I go through the pictures, and then I'll say, I need to see this, and I need to see a little more. Bit by bit, it gets set up. We shoot two at a time possibly sometimes three at a time. And that's just to be as efficient as possible. The biggest problem with that is that uh, we Ooh. don't get a vacation. Favorite job, job site, location. I love the one at the cottage on the island. I, I know I've heard so much about that cottage show. It, it freaks me out that everyone seemed to like that cottage show. I wasn't on the construction crew for the cottage show. Um, I think I did some PA work and uh, otherwise I came up and visit. I wasn't part of that one. What's um, your favorite? Okay, well, I'm obviously going to say my favorite is probably New Orleans. Um, and, oh, the castle, High Park. Building that castle was probably amazing. Like, I'm sorry, what girl doesn't want to build a castle? Like, it's amazing. I built a castle. It's also where I met my husband, which is really cool. I was going to let you in on a little secret. That's where she met Blake. Yeah. See, I hired Blake. He was working with a, a framing crew, and... Uh, they brought Blake in and the two of them saw each other and I think they kind of love it first sight. Next thing you know, I find out that they're together <laughs> and I hired this guy. It's like, oh man, here we go again. Uh, dating in the workplace, uh, marriage in the workplace. It is what it is. <laughs> and Blake has worked out to be absolutely incredible for the crew. Go ahead. Uh, did you ever go after the bad construction companies to show them what they messed up? How mad do you get? Okay. So for me, it's always been, okay, I've heard people say, why don't you name them? Because they changed their names. It doesn't do anything. That's I'm trying cool. to educate you. Thank you. Uh, there has been a couple of times that I actually drove to the contractor's place. Uh, one was on camera. It was on the show. And uh, I was really upset, but I decided to not yell and scream and actually grab him by the back of his head and smack him one. That's it was about it was about a conversation. 
Do you realize what you've done here? What are you going to do about it? Is it me that has to fix this? Do you care about these people? Me too. And in the long run, what ended, what ended up happening is that, no, they didn't really care. They didn't again and again and again. Uh, so we started from that show. We started to set up with the government in an organization that we could send the bad people to these people and they would go and see what they're doing wrong and whether or not they should go to jail. I think it's tough too. Like um, you don't get to see everything and, and things that go on behind the scenes. So when you do experience that and you see what a contractor actually does, a lot of the times I try to give them the benefit of the doubt. Like maybe they just didn't know enough and they weren't educated enough. Um, a lot of the times, unfortunately, that's not true with some of the jobs we work on. Mike, how old were you when you first started doing this type of work? When did you become interested? Jen, my father was a jack of all trades, master of none. I didn't know that until I got older and I didn't understand that statement. Um, I was probably three years old when I started working beside him. I was, remember, there was no PlayStation, any of that crap when I was a kid. It was hammer screwdrivers. Uh, six years old, I rewired the whole second floor of the house. By the time I was 12, I finished my very first basement electrical plumbing stairs, completely finished it, even with a bar. And then at 19, I was offered under contract for two years to run a very large construction company. And that was the beginning of the pro stage into doing houses, additions, you name it. And now that I'm 25, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> I've been doing it for about 40 years. It's an awful long time. It's, it's fun. It's, um, we, you know, we have a lot of fun behind the scenes. All of us are friends outside of this. Uh, and that's why I think we all enjoy working together so much is because um, we enjoy the work. We enjoy play. We go out together afterwards. We hang out on weekends. Um, I think everyone's fabulous. And even the camera crew, like we're all just a really close knit family. Well, it's and it is. We have two families, my family and the crew. And the crew is not just all the contractors that work with us, but the production work. I mean, you never see the sound man. You never see the director. You never, age, you never see. Apparently. Uh, wow. Thank you, Rebecca. Wow, Rebecca, that's very sweet. Uh, yes, I've been filming now for twenty years. So that's uh, been on television. I think nineteen years. Almost. So we're, we're almost at twenty. Years. Almost nineteen years on television, and we're going to be doing something big for the twenty-year anniversary. Are we? Yes, we are. Uh oh. Yes, we are. Something big for me. Where for can a I find another one like you? Like who? Like, like me? You. I'm going to go with like me. <laughs> <laughs> I wish you were in Halifax. Halifax is beautiful. Uh, yes, we love Halifax. There's uh, a lot of things. Uh, Mahone Island, Mahone Bay, uh, Peggy's Cove. Uh, uh, I loved it. I really did. I loved it there. And you know what? I kind of miss traveling with COVID. I really do. Remember I said Sherry likes to travel. We, what is we, the crazy thing you see? What is, what is the crazy thing you see on the job? So I guess what's the craziest thing you've ever seen on a job site? Wow. Um... There are so many things that happen on the job site. So the craziest thing, there's everything is crazy. And we're going to show you a, a blooper video that you're really going to love and when I said, as I go back to uh, if we made a television show about all the funnies, you'd probably like it better. What do you think? Oh, I always like, I laugh at everything. I need a homes hug. Oh, I think she meant from you though. <laughs> Mike, I learned so much from you. You're an honest and hardworking guy. Yeah, don't tell anyone. We, we do our best. <laughs> Actually, we care. And that's the wonderful thing about everyone around us is that all the contractors care. My family cares. The production people care. As a matter of fact, no one is allowed in my company, to be honest with you, unless they actually care. And that's, I think, how everything works so wonderful. I had a Sherry, how do you balance work and family life? I think I read it um, while you were speaking. Um, but I, I do find that can be difficult because um, Callie is so young. Actually, she's getting older. So it's, a, it's, it's getting easier. But I used to, I came back to work two months postpartum, and I used to bring her um, on site, like not on the construction site, but to work with me. Uh, and it was, a, it was a hard balance, but you figure out what works best and what. Has a former contractor ever showed up while you were fixing it in the filming? The answer is yes. yes. We had a contractor drive up and I couldn't believe the audacity of this guy because he says, what are you doing here? I've already fixed this place. You're coming to do my work. And I, and I said to him, I said, so you didn't do anything wrong. Is that correct? Like, everything's perfect. You didn't screw the, the homeowner. You didn't screw up at all. No, I didn't. I says, well, you know what? You're going to have to watch the show because, yes, you did. Everything you did was wrong. You didn't get permits. Did you want to come help me fix it? 
And he said, no. And he drove away. We've also done a job with the original contractor who lived beside the house we were working on. Um, we've had some, some of those have been interesting and, you know, you just try to, to keep the peace and love watching and learning. You are real and caring. All involved seems to have your attitude. Uh, yeah. So I love this, that so many people get involved while we do these live Facebook. So here's a question for you, all you people out there and in the uh, Southern States, all y'all. Yes, I have worked with Brian from Renovation Island. So is he, Brian's amazing, he's so fun. Sorry, continue. Yes. So here's a question. We are toying with the idea of going on a bigger scale of doing this every single week. And I want to know if that's what you'd like. We're going to keep filming and we're going to keep doing television. But this one on one thing, this information package that we can do, I want you to send me a whole bunch of notes. Should we do it or should I just stick to television? <laughs> So what we're going to do is we're going to show this wonderful, funny blooper, and then Sherry's going to exit stage right. And in this case, it's stage, well, I guess Whatever that way is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> so let's watch this blooper. I think you're going to have a laugh, and uh, we love Sherry. Bye, guys. What are you doing today? Continuing with the framing, making sure that everything keeps moving slowly. <laughs> we want to make sure that everything moves as slow as possible. Officer, my son needs to go to jail. Hello? He's getting on my nerves. You yeah, jerk, let us do what we want. Yeah, we're not kids anymore. Yeah. God. We got you just a little bit of, oh, oh what? <laughs> Hi. Cherry's the favorite. It's true. I'm okay with it. I love you, Dad. It's a thing. Which one's bigger? <laughs> now, uh, I had to put on my earphones so I could hear that, but I have to tell you that we have wild blooper videos that we get to watch internally every single year. We do it around Christmas, and it's just when we do the Christmas party, we show these real bloopers. And if you thought that was funny, those ones should be on HBO. So who knows? Maybe one day we'll actually give those to the public and you'll like them. Up next, we're going to be talking about my pond. So let me give you a little bit of what's been happening I've lived, I live on my property now for about 15 years, 10 acres, and I have a pond out in the back. It's probably about less than half an acre, and I'm talking about the pond itself. I'm very meticulous, as you may know, uh, that my grass is cut like crazy, that it's, it's, the property looks wonderful, that it's a, I don't want to call it a bed and breakfast, but I will tell you it is serenity. The pond started to overgrow after years and years. And uh, I, I, I was looking at it. I would send my guys in. I would be part of it. We clean the hills. Last year, I had Derek suit up into one of those hip waders and get down there. And we were clipping all of the cattails, we'll call them bulrushes, right at the bottom of the water. So the water supposedly drowns it. This is what I was told. Now, this took days and days and days. We touched maybe, maybe 20% of the pond. Uh, a year later, it's growing more and more. So I meet this guy when I took my boat down to Coburg. Uh, he just, he's got a company, Weeds Be Gone. He gives me his card. He says, I can clean your pond. And Weeds Be Gone, I'm thinking, you're a landscaper. How the hell do you clean a pond right? Because I'll tell you. I called up a company and he said $100,000 to bring in a big tractor to scoop it all out, clean the bottom, truckload after truckload would go out again. And $100,000. I said, are you kidding me? I knew that would ruin my property. So the guy that I met in Coburg, his son came to my house. His name is Nick. And we're going to be talking to him in just a second. I learned so much, this, this was just done on my property about a week ago. So from me to you, I want to educate you on what we need to know about a pond. Where's Nick? He's coming, I see him. Come, can you? Nick, how are you today? I'm good, how are you, Mike? Uh, no, I'm good, thank you. I'm gonna have to put on my earphones so I can hear you. Good. 
Okay, now you came to my place and uh, you, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show the video first. So okay. this way they can, they get a little bit about it and we'll be right back to you. Okay, so. go ahead. All right, here comes the video. Nick, I've been living here for 15 years now and I love this property, 10 acres. It comes with this beautiful pond or at one time it was beautiful. Why is this pond not the way it was before? A lot of it is from runoff from the farms around. A lot of the leaves fall into the pond and turns into rotting materials at the bottom. So that builds up. The weeds just eventually will take over the pond if it's left unmaintained. Weeds be gone. The first thing that came to my mind was weeds be gone, you're a landscaper. But you're not a landscaper. We're not landscapers, we're pondscapers. Pondscapers. Yeah. We turn swamps into swimming pools sometimes. I can't wait to see this. Yeah. Let's do it. Okay. Gotta be kidding me. I gotta get me one of those. You can tell this pond hasn't been maintained in a long time. I got 10 acres. I'm working on the house, the garage, the shop, all kinds of other things. I didn't know I had to maintain the pond. I do now. The bulrushes, what we need to do is cut them right at the bottom. What's great about this is we've got that little cutter that cuts them. What happens is the water goes back in and drowns them and they can't regrow again. Because right now, this is looking like a mess. Oh yeah, put your hat on for this one. Nick has been going for about 10 minutes and he's already cleared this area. And what a way to trim the pond. With me and my guys, it would take, I don't know, a week and probably full suits to get in that water. Talk about a mess, talk about frustration. What he's doing is literally going up the side of the pond, almost hedging the wild growth, bringing it back down into the pond, letting it float. Later on, he's gonna grab his cage, pull it out of the pond and put it in the bin that we have placed here. Afterwards, cleaning the bottom, also putting that in another bin, then additives go in. That's gonna fill it with the better nutrients to keep it clean, to keep it looking really good. That sounds like a pretty quick process. For me, way too long for him. He said a day or two. Pondscapers. That's amazing. Nick. You know, when you first showed up, I, I was worried about the machinery you were going to put on my property. And I got to say, when you came off the trailer on that machine and did not harm my property and then drove it down that hill like it was uh, like I wanted to get on that fucking Bronco, you did incredible. Now, I've got to ask you a couple of questions simply because there's a lot of people out there that said, are you okay to do this because are you not screwing up mother nature by cleaning up the pond okay so in some cases you know it does disrupt the the nature of the pond with the habitat and wildlife most cases what happens is as the pond goes through different stages of its life it actually starts to die off so as the pond's dying it uh it overloads itself with nutrients which is uh is very you know overtaking for weeds and once the runoff starts coming through some of these ponds an overloading of nutrients and an overloading of weeds can actually become quite harmful to the ecosystem and the wildlife as well so they call the process eutrophication so as the pond dies a lot of the wildlife is unable to live in there as it lacks oxygen it lacks flow and the bottom of muck is so rich in nutrients that nothing is actually able to to live in there and anaerobic bacteria will build up and feed the weeds with more phosphorus and nitrogen over the years and if left unmaintained it would actually not only look like the pictures we're looking at now but much worse uh, sometimes having no water left and just muck left for for nothing really essentially okay uh, yeah. Let me let me just talk about that for a sec so we can explain okay. it in detail. I'm going to help you with this. One, I used to have fish in the pond. And right. then after a while, it was mainly because of the muskrats or that weasel type. They came in and ate the fish. Then the coyotes came in and ate those guys. It was a vicious cycle. When you talk about the nutrient infused, what you're meaning is because there's farms around me and they spray, they add all kinds of things to the field to grow their crops as the rain comes down because this pond is actually naturally fed from a water source where mother nature has carved that path when it rains it's picking up those nutrients and bringing it to my pond correct that's correct mike yeah so it's called external loading so the the nutrients is loading the pond externally from runoff a lot of um 
you pick it up from the ground naturally from the topsoil, but also from the farms is a very big, a big issue from overloading of nutrients in the lakes, ponds, and anywhere that holds water essentially. Which leads me to another path. One, it's part, this is a two part. One, how has that affected my pond? Because in my mind, I'm thinking, well, if you're feeding nutrients into the pond, shouldn't it actually help it? And two, you brought me right to this. As the water continues to follow its path, it ends up going down to the lake. And I want to know, does it make lake water bad? So let's start with number one. Number one, the reasoning of your pond is yes. So the, the, the farmlands from around, the water that's feeding the pond itself is picking up nutrients from the farms around your area, especially in your uh, on the other side of the pond, you have a farm right there. Um, when they fertilize and they'll spread a lot of you know manure, uh, fertilizers itself, they're very rich in nitrogen and phosphorus. So as that comes into the pond, it's overloading the weeds with nutrients. So it's giving the weeds almost miracle grow to just take over. And, and over the years, the fertilizers have been getting much more New, uh, nutrient rich so you're getting more nitrogen and more phosphorus being dumped into the pond so as it comes through there it does filter it a little bit uh, but when it goes downstream that water is so rich in nutrients it is also affecting lakes much much more than the average pond um, the lakes are getting taken over by bull, uh, not only bull rushes you're getting blue green algae which is toxic to the ecosystem um, we're getting a lot of that from farmland runoff. So uh, a lot of areas that have farms all around, we're trying to actually filter the water upstream before that water actually hits the lake. So that means by me hiring you to come in and do my pond and giving it that maintenance or a yearly maintenance that you told me about is wise for the ecosystem? That's correct. Dependent. So for us to come in with the big harvester and give it that initial clean up, you know, it does have some sort of effect on the way the eco life does work. But by having the treatments that we added, we're Which actually we'll talk about we're actually cleaning that water before it actually has opportunity to go downstream, which is hugely affecting the quality of the water as it leaves the pond as well. So we are using your pond the ponds are being used as a filtration system as it gets as it goes back downstream, it'll be much cleaner as it leaves the pond. Okay, what did you put in my pond? So I put in what's called uh, beneficial bacteria and enzymes. So there's a liquid and uh, pellet and puck formation that we use. So one of the liquids that we use, it's called uh, clean and clear. It actually breaks the rotting materials down at the bottom of the pond, which has built up over the years. So you get a lot of that gunk, muck, rotting leaves that these actual, this liquid goes down and it breaks it up. And it turns it, it solidifies it, okay? And then we use these things, they're called muck digesters. The muck digesters are pellet and puck formation, and they physically consume that rotting material that's been building up for so many years, and it actually will turn it into carbon dioxide and water. See, And, it, and this, is also, this is also very beneficial for the fish as well. So as these enzymes eat the muck, insects feed on these enzymes, and – the fish will feed on the insects and it's a natural life cycle. It's no different than what you do in your fish tank that's been around for many, many years. And also it's no different than uh, what you do in a septic tank to break down the solids. Everything that we use is very, very good and beneficial to the wildlife and the ecosystem. So the first thought is that a lot of people, because we put a little bit on uh, my website and then there was questions right away. Mike, aren't you hurting the environment? The truth is, is by us maintaining these ponds, we are cleaning everything, like you said, filtering before it hits the lake. And if everyone were to do this, will the water look clean again after all this? Wait till I show you. If everyone were to do this, that means that we are now cleaning everything as we go before it gets to the lake and we're actually helping the uh, ecosystem, correct? That's correct, Mike. Wow. Okay. Now I didn't know that because I really did think mother nature had its way of doing everything. And after having the property for 15 years and then seeing, uh, wow, my pond doesn't look good anymore. Cause when I first moved in, it was beautiful. It had wildlife, the birds, the crickets, the frogs, and that seemed to fade away. So your recommendations is to do this like 
once a year for sure. You want to be on my property once a year. Is that correct? Depending on the amount of growth that comes back, uh, treatments, adding treatments to your pond every year is a for sure thing that I would be recommending for you to keep the upkeep on that. Um, doing the actual physical labor of coming in and harvesting. Um, the only thing that's really you know, that we would be worrying about is the algae, the weed growth inside the pond. To have some weeds around the side of the pond is okay. But once they start to swallow the pond up, like we saw at your place there, they actually they turn into a rotting composition every year at the bottom, filling the bottom of the muck or the pond up with muck, essentially giving you less water and more opportunity for weed growth every single year. So depending on how much regrowth you get, that's when we make a judgment on if we bring a machine back in or we put more treatments in. So we would weigh out your options, but essentially a pond needs to be maintained one to two times a year to keep it a healthy uh, running operation. Now, I just got a question. Do I have problems with mosquitoes and moths and everything on my property? The truth is I don't. And stagnant water and uh, cedar trees tend to uh, uh, attract uh, mosquitoes. And you, you would have them. I try to stay clean and on top of everything. So, of course, we got a couple of mosquitoes, but nothing crazy because uh, mosquitoes love me. They called their cousins and brothers and sisters and said, man, you got to taste this guy's blood. <laughs> if there were too many mosquitoes on my property, I'd probably move. Uh, so I don't have a big problem with that. But staying on top of the water, I put in a windmill, which adds oxygen to the water because I knew the idea was much like a fish tank. We want to oxygenate that water. And what you told me is even what I have is not enough. I need to add more air to the water to keep it uh, uh, clean, correct? Yes, I, I totally agree with that. You know, the oxygen that you're bringing in with the windmill is very minimal. Uh, you're only getting oxygen when the wind's blowing. So what we do is it's called continuous laminar flow aeration. By having the continuous oxygen running 24-7 is getting rid of what's called anaerobic bacteria and allowing the natural beneficial enzymes to become a live organism again. And we use these treatments, which are engineered enzymes, that will actually jump this process and get you ahead of the game. So by putting the powders, pucks, and liquids in, they're engineered to become alive on highly oxygenated water. And there's another one I use. It's called a biostimulator that actually is almost a steroid that we would put for the lacking um, initial microbes that are in the bottom that are, that are fighting against the anaerobic bacteria which builds up from a lack of oxygen. So anything that's rotting at the bottom of the pond is pulling oxygen from the bottom of the water column. So it's oxidizing at the bottom. So we're re-oxygenating the bottom of the pond. So it's called it. dissolved oxygen. Okay. Uh, somebody said, how deep is my pond? It's about four to five feet deep, depending on how much rain we get. Uh, it could even get close to six feet if it fills right up. And, and some areas of that pond has gone down to three, two to three feet from muck building up from the weeds rotting in there year after year, the leaves falling in, not being maintained. So that muck level is coming up every year. It doesn't get maintained, eventually leaving you with no water. Which is not good. Somebody asked uh, just a moment ago, uh, when is the best time to actually work on the pond like you did? Would that be the fall? It would be more near the end of the season after all the wildlife has done their thing in the pond. So we don't do anything before spawning, uh, bass spawn and fish spawn in the lakes. Anytime after July 15th, you're not allowed to work in the lakes. Um, birds nest a lot in the starting of the season. So we don't do any type of bull rush removal at these points in time. Um, we do follow within the regulations of when you're allowed to cut, which is pretty much any time after, after June. July 1st is, gives you pretty much clearance to cut in the lakes. And birds, you know, birds can still be nesting in those areas. So we do a little bit of research on what's what's around in that area as well. Okay, but I, I want yeah, yeah, I, I want everyone to know that we're going to be uh, Nick did a lot of aerial shots of before, during, and after. We're going to put that up on the website within uh, hopefully the next couple of days because we're trying to get all that information. Uh, we do have an after picture I want to show everyone of the pond, which actually blew me away. Look at it now. We see the water's a little dirty, but after a little while, because of the chemicals you put in there and some more rain, this is going to clear up and look really, really good. So one I thing can't I believe say, the difference. Yep. One thing I want to say is, so what we're putting in is not a chemical. It's an okay. engineered enzyme. So we don't use any type of chemicals 
to to cure the water or help clean the water. It's actually these treatments are live organisms that are natural, not naturally, but they're physically cleaning that water and keeping it an equal healthy balance. So the chemical treatments are very harmful to the ecosystem and we don't use chemicals. Thank you for correcting me on that. I should oh, that's something that. that I thought I would just correct you on there, Mike. No, no, you have to because this is the information that we want to give everyone. And let's be right. clear on it that we are helping the environment and not yeah. hurting the environment. Yeah, yeah. Nick, thank you so much. I look forward to seeing you again next year. If I have any more questions from anyone else there, I'm going to bring you back on. Okay? Yeah, send them my you. way or bring me on. I appreciate it. And uh, yeah, take care and enjoy the rest of your day. Keep making it right, buddy. Take care, man. All right, next up, we have a designer that's uh, here working in Improved Canada, and uh, we're going to be talking about the new trends in the COVID. You know, who would have thought make money on masks, the stuff that's out there on the market, what's happening in design. Uh, this wonderful lady, I believe her name is Massa, and uh, are you there, Massa? There you are. Hi. Did I say your name correctly? Yes. Uh, like... Absolutely, yes, because a lot of people call me Masha, which is not correct, but Masha is the correct way of it. Well, I, I like to do things right, so I ask a question, I get an answer. Let's make it right. I guess we'll make it right. <laughs> Masha, now that everyone is really stuck at home, we've had an increase in lumber like you can't imagine right now the percentage of building a house has gone up simply because of the lumber. Everyone's working on their backyard. Barbecues are no longer in the store. Outdoor furniture, no longer in the store. People are working on their own property. When it comes to design, you know, you've got a professional company. What changes have, have, have really come this way during this pandemic? Um, actually, that's a very good question because, you know what, right at the beginning, it was a difficult time for everyone. Uh, so everyone were scared for their families, friends, businesses. So the business, my business was very down or like any other business. Shut but, down. Yeah, exactly. But because human is like very adaptive creature, like they get adopt adapted to situations very easy. I think COVID-19 is one of them that after a while, people started giving me a call and asking for quotations back to back because they realized, okay, for their, for their mental health, it's their house that it needs to be beautiful, positive, cozy, and then it needs to have the capacity to sustain their needs while all over the world is close to them. So for example, um, before um, places like home offices, like theater rooms, uh, pools, they were ads onto the house. People were not like giving so much attention to those areas, but now they're figuring out, okay, they have to make more attention to that and they need to make it more of a living spaces. Like home offices is a huge part of the evolution that is going on into design. People are like calling me that looking for more, like more working spaces in the house. For the home office, I think before it was more masculine or it was uh, more of like- It was the normal test. thing. It was a normal thing that, um, you know, the guy had an office in the sorry, house. One second, I think I don't have your voice. Oh, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you now. Okay, but, but it, was, it was the one thing that a man had an office in the house and not too many females, right? But today, yeah. even in my company, uh, which I've got a lot of employees, probably 65 to 100 employees at any given time for production and construction, what has happened is that I've had to send people home because that shutdown affected every company. Mm -hmm. By mm -hmm. sending them home, they worked from home. And all of a sudden, this new commercial world that I'm living in, never mind everyone else, is we are realizing that people can work from home. So we're having less cars on the road, which was great for the environment, by the way. This sure. is has been a big change for you in design that uh, uh, because of this, People want to hire you to design offices for both men and women everywhere. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. And then they're asking for like bigger windows, more for black hat the lights, or like having more comfortable chairs, suitable desks, um, like more of the accessories that reminds me of uh, them of good things. So 
it's a lot of change that go, that's going on because not only people are using the home offices for the matter of working for their companies, but also there are a lot of moms out there that are trying to school their kids. So they bring their kids actually to the home office and they start working with them. So according to the needs of each person, we're having like huge, huge changes going on. Well, there's, there's a double factor here. One is that the office is at home because we're sending people to work at home, which is actually working for my company. And two, because they're home so much, your point is what you're saying is that they need to feel good about being stuck indoors. Yeah. And that, is, that has made the changes to building a new deck outside, working in the backyard, making that dreamscape like I have on my property. So they have the serenity zone. So your business went from down to right back up again uh, because people are now really wanting to make their home more comfortable, correct? Exactly, exactly. Um, you know, the, and another thing is um, in Canada, uh, we have a lot of months are cold weather. So now people are considering if they're going to be stuck at home, how they can make their houses like more of the vow factor that every time that they're at home, they don't feel as stuck. They feel like, okay, there is living going on. We're going to have fun with our family. Uh, like we're going to have a good time at home actually. And I think, you know what, it's actually a good thing because it's teaching us that we can enjoy our time more and more with our family. And that's a really good thing actually. And if you create that space, that area for yourself, it's going to be amazing. I have to agree with you. We need to get back to some sort of normalness or happiness. We tend to be stepping into right now this, they call it the second phase, which scares me a little bit. I mean, they've already dropped the numbers being in your house, yeah. uh, get togethers, et cetera, masks everywhere now. And I understand that. Uh, what scares me more about this second possible wave is the economics behind it. You know, the, all governments around the world have probably spent more money than they even uh, ever could find. Paying that back is going to be bad. I, I'm worried about the risk of real estate value. Uh, hopefully nothing does happen. But Massa, thank you so much. And I hope you keep making it right. And you enjoy what you're doing. Just see you smile all the time. So that's all that matters. Yeah. You get to help people. <laughs> Thank you so their. much. Thank you. And Thank we will you. Talk it to was you my again. honor talking to you live, and hopefully, everything going to be fine for everyone soon. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see. So from a fan, we are watching homes and on homes and my son comes back with the overalls and then goes around fixing the house. Mike looking for a new crew member. I love this. I got to tell you, the one thing I did not expect in uh, doing my show for all these years was the kids. The kids, they sit down and watch the show. I don't get it. And next thing you know, they want to carry their toolbox. They want to they want to put on the overalls. I've done so many stand up uh, talking on stage for many years now, and I happen to love doing it. And there's always a couple young kids in the audience that want to come up on stage with me, and I bring them up. We take pictures, and and as far as I'm concerned, from that spawned an idea. I want to do a cartoon for the young have me and my family in live and then morph into the cartoon. So tell me what you think about that. So for now, guys, I really appreciate you sitting and talking. Don't forget the one question I asked you. Do you want me to keep doing this week after week after week? I want everyone to know. Let me know. If you respond big, I'm going to keep doing this. It doesn't matter. We're just going to add one more thing to my schedule. And I find this fun. Second part, how would you like to see a cartoon for the kids? Until next time. Love you, man. Keep, keep smiling.